أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتحدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العصر والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالحدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا صدق الله العلي العظيم <laughs> the, privi- the, the, the privilege of faith has been our ongoing topic. Tonight is lecture number nine. Our discussion has been revolving around the rebuilding and reaffirming of our aqidah and our ideology, attempting now to strengthen and fortify our faith and our belief at a time when there is prepared attacks happening on our aqidah to our youth and to others. And not only to fortify and strengthen that iman, but to see it as a privilege given to us either by Allah or by our parents or through our parents. And once we identify to be a privilege, we do everything we can to uphold and to maintain that privilege. The past few nights we've been talking a little bit about divine leadership. And we started off with a discussion on Ghadir a few nights ago where we looked at the idea and the concept of Ghadir being not only the announcement of a spiritual leader, but that of a successor of the entire Ummah and the entire divine system of Islam. From last night's discussion, where we looked at three important terms, Khalifa, Imam, and Wali, we looked at, very briefly, mind you, Khilafat, Imamat, and Wilayat, in an attempt to understand why these terms are used by the various groups within Islam. And the biggest takeaway that I want all of you to understand, and myself too from yesterday, was that even if there are those individuals of the Ahl Sunnah world, or the non-Shia world, who take Ghadir to be an announcement of the Bartari, or the elevated maqam, or the level of Imam Ali, they reduce it to nothing but a spiritual leader. And I mentioned, if you, if you recall, the example of a resident alim in today's communities, majority of them across North America, he's given a very specific task, but the everyday running of the center is given to another group of people. And they've separated ultimately church and state, or the alim from, let's say, the board of trustees, or the EC, et cetera, et cetera. And that's precisely what Saqifa was. Saqifa was a separation of church and state. That yes, we agree that Imam Ali was the most pious, in spirituality, nobody could touch him. And what the, what the Prophet did on Ghadir was announce him, announce him as the spiritual leader of the Ummah. But the political Khalifa of the Ummah was left unanswered. And that's why Saqifa happened. And so this separation now causes a lot of problems. When you separate spirituality from the government, or you separate taqwa from the governor himself, or you separate the deen from politics, then the ones who are involved in politics have no standard to uphold. And thus a dhulm and a dhalim as a governor is very common. And thus we, we, we saw that. Up and down the governors of the three khulafa, we saw many individuals who had no business being the governor of the khalifa of the time. Ma'abiyah is one example. Ma'abiyah was gifted Sham. After the second khalifa uh, sent him there to conquer Sham and he conquered Sham, he then made him the governor of Sham. Ma'abiyah has no business anywhere near the deen, let alone a governor of a portion of the deen. But that's what happens when you separate spirituality from the government. And that's why Khalifa is one meaning and the Imam is one meaning. Ultimately within the Shia ideology, an Imam, a leader, an Alim, let's say in a center, is the Sadparast of that organization. 
or an alim is the leader of the entire ummah, be it in, 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 in discussions on money and finances, on the movement of the ummah, on khutbahs and, and, and salat, on istikharas and nikahs, it doesn't matter. There's no dimension of Islam that is void of the spiritual leader. Because Islam is an all-encompassing system. You can find the deen in everyday politics, you find the deen on the musalla as well. So that was the biggest takeaway from yesterday. But as I promised you last night, we'll look at four dimensions of wilayats today. We ended off our discussion last night talking about what a wali is. And wali comes from walaya, which ultimately means authority, authority given by Allah. And this specific wilayat, and as you know, wali is used in a very general term in the Quran. There's the awliya of Allah, as well as the awliya of shaitan. So wali could mean a very generic term authority or someone who has been given authority. But in our discussion, it's specifically that authority given to the Prophet of Allah and his family. Starting with the Prophet of Allah, and of course, by that vertical plane, down to the family of the Prophet. Keep in mind the ayat of wilayat. Innama waliyukum Allah wa rasul. One wilayat given to various dimensions of the verse. It is a vertical plane. That was yesterday. Come to today. Shaykh Mutahari rahmatullah alayhi has described four different dimensions of wilayat. Wilayat mawaddat, wilayat imamat, wilayat dhiyamat, wilayat tasarruf. Two of them we've talked about indirectly already in the past two nights. Meaning what? The authority to lead the ummah at the spiritual level, being the imamat. Or, and the authority given for the imam to lead individuals in geopolitical, social issues. That we touched upon. What I really want to focus today on is the walayt at the mawaddat level given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That authority on the Muslims to love the Ahlul Bayt. And I want to look at various verses of the Quran, some powerful ahadith, but more importantly, this concept of mawaddat to get to some understanding. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You're very scattered. Would you mind coming a little bit in the middle if you don't mind? I know. Please, if you don't mind. Just to the center here, please, if you just come. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. The youngest, youngest are right in the front, mashallah. That's amazing. Alhamdulillah. Yes. One more salat, Muhammad, wa Muhammad, please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us has commanded us to love the family of the Prophet. And of course, by extension, the Prophet of Allah as well. And both Sunni and both Shia ideology referred to it as the dhururiyat of the deen, the essential components of the deen. And perhaps the biggest delil we have of why we have to love the family of the Prophet is the inclusion of the salawat inside everyday salat. That inclusion of the, salawat, uh, of the salawat that we have in Sunni and Shia fiqh both. In fact, Sunnis also believe that if you take away the salawat from the salat, your salat becomes void and batil. It has to be there. You cannot replace that one line with anything else that you want to. That inclusion at the fiqh ahkam level, on the everyday level, reminds us that you, we've been commanded for this love. Okay. However, it's important to understand what is meant by love here. Okay, so well, I'll share with you a couple of very famous uh, verses of the Quran that all of you understand, but perhaps through a different lens altogether. First of all, understanding that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I'll try to re reduce the number of salawat. I know the mouth is right now dry, inshallah. <coughs> Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> Where was I? Yes, okay. I found myself, sorry. I lost myself for fucking, yes, thank you very much. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is very specific in the rewards asked by the prophets of Allah. You know, and you do know, I know you know, that every prophet except for one openly announce that I don't want an ajr or a reward from you. For everything you've done, I don't want anything from you. Okay? But the Prophet of Allah was very adamant in saying that I have a request from all of you. 
I want ajr for what I've done to you and done with you. I've given you 23 years of prophethood. I've perfected your deen. I've given you the book, the sharia, everything. I took you from the brink of actual disaster. I, I, I pulled you out of the darkness. I gave you everything you wanted. I gave you freedom from the clutches of, of, of Abu Sufyan and the dhulm of that day. And I do have, he's the only prophet of the 124,000 prophets who flat out said, I want a reward for what I've done for you. But the reward has nothing to do with me. And very famously it says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ عَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Okay? That I ask of nothing of you in terms of ajr except that you have mawadda for my qurba, for my family. Okay? There's not one tafsir that we accept, Sunni or Shia, that, that do not include the Ahlul Bayt inside the qurba. Meaning the only definition of qurba is the Ahlul Bayt. So what the Prophet is asking us, us in, 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 in exchange of what he's done is for you to have mawaddat for my family. Does not say muhabbat for my family. I really want to make this very important distinction tonight. There is two different instances in the Quran where Allah is asking for mawaddat from us. One is with our spouse, one is with the family of the Holy Prophet. Okay. Surah Rum says what? Women ayatihi an khalak an khalak an khalak min anfusikum azwajan li tuskunu ilayha li tuskunu ilayha wa ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan wa rahma inna fi dhalika li ayatin li qawmi yatafakkarun very essential discussion tonight please one that i'm sure you've heard many times from this member from different scholars the verse says that from his signs is that he's created for you and from you azwaj spouses and he has, so that you can find serenity in them. They tuskunu ilayha. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he has placed between the two of you, your husband and your wife now, two things, mawaddat and rahma. Rahma we understand to be mercy and forgiveness. Mawaddat we have translated as love. It's not love. Muhabbat is one thing, mawaddat is a, is a separate thing altogether. And to give you a, a, an idea of what the difference is, in the beginning, when we are married to our, to, to our spouses, hopefully, you know, we verbalize our love for our spouse. You know, that's, you know well, we buy flowers only when we, when we mess up or we, we have a mistake, then we buy flowers. You know, in, in, in the South Asian world, we don't, we're not really expressive with our emotion, especially the men, right? The Western, you know, us Western husbands are a little bit more expressive. But the back home, you know, they see typical Indian Pakistani husband, you know, you only find them to be expressive, like poetry and Ghana's, you, you, won't, you won't find that. However, Hadith says that the moment that you say, I love you to your wife, it stays in her heart for a very long time. I mean, even our sixth imam says, you should say, I love you to your wife. So I want you to imagine you have a husband who breaks all these cultural barriers and, and ends up saying, I love you, I love you, I love you to your wife many, many times. Expresses verbally his muhabbat for his wife. As the marriage goes on, he continues to express his love for her, mashallah. But as the marriage goes on, he begins to gain some weight. He gets a little bit heavy. Please follow the example. And the wife has been on his case to please, if you can, this month of Ramadan, attempt to lose some weight. It's a good opportunity. Okay, let's forget the book order, let's forget the samosas for a second, and let's focus on our weight. I need you to lose 20 pounds. I want you to live for a long time. I want you to be a grandfather of, my, uh, of, of, of your kids' kids and be there for your daughter's wedding and blah, blah, blah. This is what I really, I want you to focus on your, on your weight and your health. Yeah, no problem, honey, I will, but I still love you. I still love you. I'll always love you. And as Ramadan now kind of goes on and Ramadan is done, now Eid comes in and now you're halfway through Shawwal, you didn't lose the 15, 20 pounds. In fact, you gained, mashallah, 10 more pounds. And as you're overeating at the dining table, a wing on one hand, a pizza on the other, biryani in your mouth, you still say, honey, I love you. I love you. There's barbecue sauce on your face. There's pizza crumbs on your plate. But honey, I love you. Now she says, look, you can take your I love you and get out of my house. The words mean nothing to me anymore. If you loved me, you would have lost at least 10 pounds in the month of Ramadan. If you loved me. So after a while, in the beginning she would blush every single time. Every single time you would say, I love you, I love you, I love you. Hi Allah. She would melt. 
But now, 15, 20 years later, she's asking you for one simple thing. You can't give it to her. And that is what the love is for her. It's the action, not only the verbalization of it. That action plus the verbalization. Now you go on a strict diet. You go for a walk. You hit the gym. And for a good month, six, you know, six weeks, two months now, you're down 10 pounds. And you can tell on your body when a person loses 10 pounds, you can see, you, you, you can see his face shrinks, everything shrinks. And now one day you wake up, now you have a new slim body. And mashallah, you say, honey, I love you. And she'll say, hi, Allah. <laughs> she'll melt. Why? Because the I love you was attached with the 10 pound weight loss. That attachment is called mawaddat. Action with the verbalization of I love you. After a while, the words become cheap. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet, tell them that you don't want an ajr or a reward except for mawaddat fil qurba. Except for that mawaddat fil qurba. We take it as expression of love. Whereas mawaddat is not just expression of love, it's also action attached to it. No, there's nobody in this room that doesn't love the Ahlul Bayt. We all love the Ahlul Bayt. When they are shaheed, we come and we commemorate. We cry. We beat ourselves. We drape ourselves in black. We cry more for them than we do for our own family. When they are born and we have their jashans, we come in the best of clothes. We come and sometimes we sponsor, we decorate. All out, mashallah, amazing celebration. But do they require more from our love? Is it enough to come and shed some tears and do some nares and verbalize the love that we have for the Ahlul Bayt? Because the reality is that even those who are non-Muslim love the Ahlul Bayt. Inshallah, in a matter of weeks with Shaykh Hussain, who's coming for the second half, you'll commemorate the Shahadat of, of, of Amir al-Mu'mineen. In history, it says that at his funeral, those who mourned him were not just Muslims. The Jews, the Christians, all came and sent their condolences. They were heartbroken. They were devastated. Because Imam Ali had such a rapport with them that it's almost as if he was also their mullah as well to a certain degree. Meaning what? They had immense love for Amir al-Mu'mineen. But the love that we have of Ali and the love that a Jew has of Ali are two different loves. It has to be. Because we have that ma'rifat of Ali. They might see Imam Ali as a good leader or a kind man or a smart man or a courageous man. We see him as the wali and a hujjat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With that level of ma'rifat, the responsibility also increases. You know, it's, it's sad sometimes. It really is. You know, when 13th of Rajab rolls around every single year, you know, now this, I don't know if it's a new thing or not, but now sometimes in the streets of Bombay, even in cities in, in Pakistan, you see that, you know, it's a dance festival out there. They actually have instruments. They play instruments, and there is not just people jumping up and down, it's choreographed dancing happening. And then there are, there's always a few guys that come and they start, you know, throwing some money at the guys who are dancing. All in what? All in love of Imam. They have love, they have immense love of the middle moment. I mean, they're celebrating like they, you know, there's an there's a ear to ear grin on their face. They are ecstatic, wearing the best, most colorful clothes. But if you ask Imam Ali to sit there in that mahfil, will he sit? He won't sit. I mentioned a few nights ago the idea that even love allows us to grieve when they leave this world. But that grief also has its limits. There are some grieving, some majalis that even Imam Hussein wouldn't attend, I'm sorry. So the point I'm trying to make is that mawaddat of the Ahlul Bayt, the command from Allah for the love of the Ahlul Bayt, has to be attached with amal. Where instead of you know, renting instru instruments and, and training dancers to come and dance on 13th of Rajab, maybe we can extract one hadith of Amid al-Mu'mineen and apply that in our life. Maybe now we'll say, look, not only do I love you, Amid al-Mu'mineen, but I also am following your words. Because just like your wife, he'll say, look, you said I love you since you were a child, but your actions go against what I want you to do. There are people who loved Imam Ali to the point where they were, they were convinced he was God. That's love. That's extreme love. That look, you are such a great man, you can't be a makhluk. You have to be at some divine, divine nature. And he sends la'anat on them. He sends them to, to, to hell. But Mullah, they love you. That's not the love that I want. 
That's not mawaddat. That might be muhabbat. It might be lavzi. It's not mawaddat. Has to be amal plus the the, 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 the expression of love for the ahbab bayt. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And I ask you to be very, very careful. I know these are you know, difficult things for me to say, but I can say them to you. Even sometimes in our qasidas, our poets, our shu'ara, even those of you who are monthly but khans in the audience, look at the words, what you're saying, first of all. Not everything that is, that, that, that is a qasida should be read on the stage, I'm sorry. Some of the shares are very, very khatarnak and dangerous. They go against the very, the very uh, iman of Imam Ali himself. When they start to praise a group of people in the, sh- in the shayri that Imam Ali has cursed. So at that moment, what are you doing? Where, where is your love at that moment? If you're there to celebrate the birth of this first imam, and you're saying words that go against what he wants to believe in, then where is that love, first of all? So love has to be attached with amal. It's not just saying, I love you, Imam Hussein. It's not just crying on the day of Ashura. It's following his revolution and, and, and his path. That's why when you look at the various ayat of the Qur'an, it's up and down the Qur'an. The last verse of Surah Takafur that says what? ثُمَّ لَا أَلُونَ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ On the day where you will be asked about your bounties, about the bounties and na'im and na'mat given to you, the blessings given to you. Now various tafasir relate a conversation that has had between Abu Hanifa and Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. Very famous story, I'm sure all of you have heard before. That our sixth imam is asking Abu Hanifa that this verse refers to na'im, these blessings that Allah says, I'm going to ask you in the day of judgment about. What are these blessings he's referring to? Abu Hanifa says, um, food, water, shelter, those types of things. And to explain to him, he gives a very beautiful answer, Imam Salih. And I, I'll use my own example. Let's say, for example, when I come back to New Jersey, whenever I come back, I stay at, let's say, you know, Ms. Babai's house. Okay, he's hosted me before, and, you know, it's, it's like a home to me. And for four or five days, he says, Asabai, please come and stay with us. I said, sure, no problem. So I arrive, I move in, and Sister Norma makes all my favorite dishes. You know, she has a white chicken dish, which I love. She makes amazing bindi, she makes really good dal, and chai, of course, is wajib kafai inside Ms. Babai's house. Chai has to be there. And everything that I like that she knows, you know, I, she, you know, you know she makes, in the morning omelet, everything, blah, blah, blah. The, day, the morning of my flight, on the way down from my room, now I have my suitcase, I have everything, he hands me a piece of paper, Ms. Rabai. And he says that this is a summary of the amount that you've eaten, the cups of rice that you consumed, the kilos of chicken that you consumed, the amount of eggs you have eaten, the cups of chai you have, you have had, the amount of data you use from my Wi-Fi. Everything is on this piece of paper, I said, by. either you, know, you can give me a little bit back to help me out, or just so, 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 so you know, this is what you have taken from me in my five days. Would he ever do that? No. Would any of you ever do that? No. Not for one day, not for five days. Would you ever sit there and ask from your mahman or your guest everything that you've given them? The sixth imam says, if we don't do that for a five-day mahman, how can we expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to question us about these things every single day of our life? It's not possible. And then he says, Ya Rasulullah, you tell me what is, what is meant by anin na'im. And then he says, the love that you are given us the Ahlul Bayt. That love of Ali Muhammad, you, you will be asked about. Now, someone like me might feel good about that. My Ahlul Bayt are mentioned in the Quran, it's amazing. But to us, it's a very difficult task. It's a very difficult task. Because the same Imam says that as a Shia, you have two choices to make. You can be a zinat for us, meaning a point of pride for us, or you can be an embarrassment for us. It could be that such a people look at you and they remember us, or they look at you and they question us. Because with ma'arifat, with awareness, comes responsibility. And it's vital that we understand that. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Has a very powerful tradition. He says, لا تزول قدم عبد يوم القيامة حتى يسعل عن عربة. The feet 
of the servants of Allah will not shake. La tazuru will not shake on the day of judgment. Hatta yus ala an arba until they're asked four questions. When they're asked four questions, then things get a little bit difficult. Who? The servants of Allah, the abd of Allah. I don't have time for all four. An umrihi fi ma afnahu. What did you do with your life? The last one here, he says, an hubbina ahlul bayt. What did you do with the love that was given to you of us, the Ahlul Bayt? So the first dimension of wilayat that Shaheen Mutahari talks about is wilayat mawaddat. It's a command of Allah. And yes, he's made it wajib on us to love the Ahlul Bayt. Why? There are two reasons, very quickly. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. First of all, all of you know that at the fitrat level, at the innate level, we are individuals who are attracted to perfection. We love things that are perfect. We shy away or separate ourselves from those things that are imperfect. Be it everything, be it in the dunya or be it in the metaphysical. If for a moment we are to accept that Allah has some naqs or some deficiency or some imperfection, we'll question our worship towards Allah. If we buy anything with a small little crack in it, we'll return it. We are people who are drawn towards perfection. That's why one of the, 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 the dalil and the proofs that we have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the proof of the fitrat. Equally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands that those things that exist inside of our fitrat, there has to be an outside external reality to feed that fitrat. Meaning if we have this love for perfection, there has to be somebody, a group of people outside of us to love in order to feed that need for perfection. So what does he do? He commands us at the fifty level to, lead, to love the Prophet of Allah and his family. Why? Because they are immaculate. That's why you look at the ma'yar of iman. This hadith Imam Abbatanari, one-liner, is in, is in Tirmizi, is in Tabari, is also in many of the uh, Shia books. Where... A companion of the Holy Prophet, I forget his name now, he says that if we wanted to understand if a person was a munafiq or not, we would judge them based on the hatred they had for Ali That's a powerful hadith. I mean, now the criteria between Iman and Nifaq is a middle moment here. Where many historians would say that we would mention Ali's name and watch the face of the person in front of us. If he... Brightens up, he's one of us. If he frowns, he's one of them. But that's the love of Ali Muhammad. Number two, and more importantly, is they know that salvation for us in this world is following the path of the Ahlul Bayt. I mentioned the idea of Qaidi Lutf a few nights ago, the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a grace that he's placed his command on us to love the Ahlul Bayt. Now, the command, of course, is potential. Right? We can verbalize Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa inside the sun all we want. But to actually convert that into amal is the key. We know enough to know that ilm and understanding is like clouds in the air. The only way that you can truly understand this ilm is if it's accepted by the hearts and then converted into amal and action. Meaning what we know in our mind, we accept by our heart and we act with our hands. That journey is called ilm. And that's the ilm that we have. We have the ilm of the perfection of Ali Muhammad. But do we follow their path? Do we understand their ahadith? Are we able to do what they did? Everything from their enemies to their loved ones to how they were inside the home. Do we know how much housework Amir al did in, in, inside of his home? I say that, and all of you might think I'm doing tawheen of, uh, of Imam Ali. That we, 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 we equate Imam Ali to Khaybar and Khandak. No doubt, those are his fadail. But part of that is the fact that he would help see the Fatima inside the home. He would sweep the home, sometimes cook the meals, sometimes look after the yateen, sometimes look after those who are non-Muslim. How are, how's our raftar towards non-Muslims? Do we just kind of rug everybody, say, oh, they're all Jahannami, I'm the only Jannati? No. These are all things that we have to adopt the path of Imam Ali. The love is there. The love is there. We verbalize every single year. We have this you know, inner movement towards the fadail of Amir al-Mu'maneen. But has it converted into amal or not? Are we doing those actions where he's now pleased with us? Or is he like our wife? He'll say, look, you've said I love you a thousand times, but you're not showing me your love the way I want you to show me your love. If you want to know my language of love, this is my language of love. Put down, let's say, the burger and pick up a, a carrot. 
Imam Ali said, look, put down the ghibat, put down the lies, put down the music, put on the hijab, keep your beard, and then claim you love me. That mawaddat is what I need. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, one thing that we mention, one more minute, one thing that we mention inside counseling and couples is to know the language of love of each other. The language of love. Okay? There are things that your wife loves for you to do, for you to say, you have to know that as a husband. There are things that you want to hear and you want done by your wife that she should know. Right? A powerful couple is one who knows the language of love of each other. Sometimes we think, you know what, I bought her flowers and she got upset. How could she get upset? I bought her flowers. She should be serving me left, right, and center. That wasn't her language of love at that moment. Right? When we hear lose 10 pounds, we think, oh, nag, 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 nag. Meanwhile, she's trying to give us a better life. That's her language of love. The same, exact same concept applies to the Ahl al-Bayt. They also have a language of love, which goes beyond the not ahead. I'm sorry. That's also expressive. But the language of love is adopt our path. Represent our ideology. Become a symbol for us, such that when somebody looks at us and says, if this is the servant, imagine the mawla and the leader himself. That's mawaddat. That's that hukam of Allah that has come down. That's the grace and the lut that Allah has given us. That I have made it almost wajib on you to love Ali Muhammad, but not for me or for them. For your benefit and for your najat in the hereafter. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our qaleel ibadat insha'Allah. We ask you Allah as the month of Ramadan is progressing to accept our amal, to forgive our sins, and to make our ibadat easier, inshallah. We ask you, Allah, to make us worthy of Imam Zaman al-Zuhur and to make us stand beside him during his mission. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.